everybody. We're gonna get started on our next segment here at Michigan House. Look at you guys, look at your pretty faces. I like yours. <laughs> All right. Like, I don't know how I gracefully put this down with all that. All right, we're super excited to be here in Midwest House celebrating. It's Michigan Day, everybody. Let me hear you. All right. For those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Margarita Hernandez. Um, I am VP at Ann Arbor Spark, a VP of Entrepreneurial Services at Spark. Um, we are very much, well, you know, honored to be here. We also are a sponsor. Um, we will be offering a panel called, what is the panel called again? We decided, yes. Women doing cool things. Yes. <laughs> so. I'm so sorry. You're going to have to tell them what you Ladies came up. Ladies love sustainability. Ladies who love sustainability because we're also celebrating. It's, it's Women's Month. It's March. So Woo! that's just how we're going to roll. Um, joining us today, I have a fair amount of really powerful women who have done some incredibly cool and awesome things. Um, before I jump too far down the road, just wanted to make sure to add in there, Ann Arbor Spark really um, has created some really impactful and cool things in the Ann Arbor region. We support economic development by promoting startups that are in tech to big tech companies, uh, putting in you know, resources, connections, um, but also really plugging in the talent um, to, to really help these businesses grow and be prosperous as they develop in our region. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit more um, on a different realm, and specifically going into tech, but into green horizons and green solutions. Okay, I'm all settled now. All right, so with me here is Heidi Poshner, Praveena Ramswamy, and Missy Stoltz, and yes. <laughs> I will help you. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to actually let them introduce a little bit more about themselves and share a little bit about their career and what role they are at right now. And then we'll kind of get started formally with our questions and the rest of our panel. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm Heidi Posher. I'm a principal consultant at Dynamic Energy Group. Um, Dynamic Energy Group is a developer of sustainable fuels and microgrid projects. Uh, we've been consulting in the utility industry for about 25 years. Um, a DEG is part of the Forum Consolidated Brands umbrella of companies. We do uh, uh, multifamily development. We have some hops hospitality properties. And then, of course, the energy development is a big part of our business. Uh, my name is Praveena Ramasamy. I have a long career in the automotive industry. I uh, worked at Toyota in many, many roles, uh, Toyota's research and development in Ann Arbor. And then I went to May Mobility, which is a startup. I think the previous group had just talked about them coming to Detroit, an autonomous vehicle public transportation company. And currently I'm at a company called EAVX where we are working on commercial vehicles for next generation, working on alternative fuels. And I do marketing, communications, and public relations. Hey, everybody. My name is Missy. I'm the least cool person on this panel. Just kidding. No, we're all great. We're great. Uh, I am the Sustainability and Innovations Director for the City of Ann Arbor, where we have a goal and objective of being carbon neutral in a just and equitable way by 2030. Woo! So it is my job and our team's job to figure out how do you do that and how do you engage everybody, whether that's the University of Michigan, the state of Michigan, our residents, our businesses, in achieving that goal and objective. And hell yeah, we will. How do I go after that? You can do it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Yahang. So I was born and raised in China. So first half of my life was in a completely different country. And I flew to this nation and went to MSU to get my college degree and end up staying for Go Green, end up staying for um, a variety of different jobs. So my background varies from you know, automotive auto, um, market research to helping MEDC do international investment attraction and eventually finding my way into the field of sustainability and circular economy. So 
Very proud to say now I am a full-on Michigander and finding my own communities and roots there. And yeah, very excited to share with you. I'm actually part of the RS group, Resource Recycling System now. We are one of the leading sustainability consulting agencies in the nation, focusing on waste management, circular economy consulting, but I'm also here today to represent an initiative called Next Cycle Michigan. So I'm excited to share more with you today, but more to come. You know what, I'm really glad you kind of just started telling a little bit of the flavor of what we're going to be focusing on, which is sustainability in the landscape of, of really Washtenaw, the region, Washtenaw County, and within the Ann Arbor region. Um, so one tidbit that I kind of, as I started doing some more customer discovery about sustainability solutions in our area was Ann Arbor in the broader region has a really old and historical footprint footprint from way back in the mid-2000s and when they used, I think it was climate tech at that point. It's become more inclusive over time. We've included circular economy and supply chain. All of these efforts are really being focused on within our area and so that's what we're going to be sharing with you is a little bit more what are those specific projects that we're going to be, that have been going on, where are they now and where do we see really all of this coming together and supporting our sustainability goals moving towards the 2030 solution. Okay, all right, so we got to, you, you started a little bit on, on, you, you know, your, on your organization. I'm gonna let them actually share a little bit more about the goals and the missions of each of their organization and then we'll formally start with questions. All right, Missy, do you wanna come back around? Oh, well it doesn't really matter for this. Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you, I'll give you the wink wink. Yeah, 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 yes. okay, I'll kick us off. Uh, well, if we're going to be carbon neutral by 2030, we have to do everything that you can possibly imagine. So we have a plan, a goal, a framework called A20, Ann Arbor, A20, carbon emissions. And in that plan are 44 actions. We're doing over 50. What? because of course we miss things and of course the world continues to evolve. But what I'll just center on is the seven kind of strategies, the cornerstone of what we're doing. We've got to figure out how we are powering our entire electrical grid with 100% renewable energy. Great news, we can, right? And technology is advanced, it's really exciting. We're exploring things like a supplemental energy utility. I don't want to invest in the utility that we have today. It's lovely, it's great, it got us here, but I want to leapfrog to a much more sustainable, uh, reliable, resilient utility of the future. So that's one of the key strategies. Another is we've got to reduce the energy we use, right? We lose 40% of our energy day in and day out in our operations. So we've got a whole bunch of initiatives focused on energy efficiency. We've also got to electrify. We've got to move away from fossil gas, from diesel and propane. And that's hard in a climate like Michigan, but we're working on really cool stuff with the US Department of Energy on thermal energy networks, figuring out how we can heat and cool our homes and businesses more efficiently. So those are the three energy. We're also working on land use because we've got to reduce the miles we travel in our vehicles by 50%. So that means we've got to be able to have walking and biking and public transit, but to places you want to go, right? So how do we change the dynamic and the kind of sense of place, the quality of our local communities? We also have to move to a cir circular economy where we change our relationship with stuff right? When we're done with this microphone, it still has use. Maybe not as a microphone, but its constituent parts can be recycled and repurposed. How do we create an economy that is much more about generation and continuing the use as opposed to extraction? Extraction from the planet and extraction from each other, right? So we've got to move towards a more circular economy. Six, we've got to invest in resilience. Climate change is here, y'all. It was snowing in Michigan when I left yesterday. Well, I, I left today, whatevs. But it was snowing yesterday. It was 70 a week ago. We have got wild, wild Wild weather patterns, climate change isn't a future problem, it's a today problem. Wait, Missy, so we've got, what's what, resilience? What is resilience? Great question. Yes. Resilience, the way we define it, is the art of bouncing forward. Okay, and I just want to take a moment and say, historically we've thought of it as bouncing back, but if you bounce back, it assumes where you started from is good enough. And for many, many people, it simply isn't, right? If bouncing back is the objective, the most resilient system I know of is poverty. It's really hard to break out of it. So we wanna help people bounce forward. Technology is changing, the economy is changing, the climate is changing. People need to, to be able to survive and thrive in that space. So investing in the resilience of our people in our place, 
And then our last strategy is cross-cutting. It's investing in things that don't belong in any one of those other categories because they belong in every one of those categories. Our equity work, education, transparency, tracking uh, and accountability of the work that we do. So we're working on lots and lots of different initiatives, stealing profusely from our peers, including our peers here in Austin, who I know very well, uh, making sure that we figure out how to do this work in a way that's just, but also replicable, because shame on us if we figure out how to do it in Ann Arbor and no one else can repeat it. So that's part of what our team works on day in and day out, and I'm so excited to work with all the people on this stage, as well as 130 other community collaborators, because this takes a village. Good luck, Pravina. <laughs> exactly. I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, lower, the lower the bar, Pravina. No, no. Uh, actually, what Missy is talking about is very much what we need to, we need to talk, girl. Because what, we, what my company is doing is addressing transportation, so commercial vehicles. We talk a lot about personal vehicles and the electrification and people moving. But if you think about it, last mile delivery is a huge energy suck, in ter I mean, emissions uh, emitter into our community. So we, we need to work together to figure out how we're going to find alternative fuels, find better logistics, for our vehicles of the future. So this is what my company is doing. We're working on work trucks, so last mile delivery, micro mobility, utility vehicles. And so we're thinking about carb states. So carb states is, is 15 states right now in the United States that have a mandate to go zero emissions. And then there are cities like Ann Arbor that are doing the same. So we're working with those cities to figure out what are your needs? How are we going to address them? And then we manufacture those vehicles. Um, so we're preparing for the future. The future is already here. Those vehicles are coming out. But things that we need to talk about are infrastructure, uh, requirements, regulations. And so that's what I'm talking about. Go. OK. So if you uh, harken back to Missy's thoughts about um, how a municipality pulls together a whole bunch of different um, abstractions and condenses them into a holistic plan that can really drive innovative change. Um, what we do at uh, Dynamic Energy Group and our parent company forum is we try to take uh, signals like those and uh, take that context as well as some of the um, challenges that are in our community with respect to growth or driving that kind of innovation. And um, we try to figure out how we can comply, um, where we have um, ways to innovate, where we have maybe a different view of the transition. Um, Missy and I are working through that right now. Um, our background is very, very heavily integrated in the fuels industry. And um, we really want to try to experiment with um, creating diff uh, electricity on site with fuel cells, but using a non-traditional fuel to be able to do that. So. Um, and we also have the uh, kind of a behemoth um, investor-owned utility that we have to work with. And so uh, rather than saying that's good or bad, I'll just say it uh, introduces complexity that help us, that, first of all, it creates challenges, but then to Missy's point, once those challenges are resolved, it kind of helps us create patterns and strategies that we can take on to the next step because again, we're very much in a transition um, and so we're building um, sustainable housing. Uh, our next project is an eight-story mass timber building that will be fueled 100% um, uh, by a microgrid that runs on renewable natural gas. We're completely disconnected from the, uh, um, from the electricity system, but we are a 100% non-combustible site, which means we create our own electricity through the fuel cell. We'll go from about, let's put it this way, if DTE, powered that building, it would produce about 7,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas a year. Through the use of uh, renewable natural gas and running it through our fuel cells, but also using geothermal, uh, creating tenant programs to bring down um, the, the overall load, uh, using some other su sustainable resources in there, we'll bring that down below uh, zero. So we'll actually be operating at a carbon negative um, perspective. Just based on the, thank you, Doug. Um, I, I think it's a huge number too. I'm like, holy shit, if 500 people can do that, what, like the, world, the sky's the limit. So um, the, our great interest, just based on the background of Dynamic Energy Group, which has been very, very active in terms of understanding metrics and benefits, um, 
measurement and verification of all sorts of utility systems is we really want to understand um, really what the data around carbon intensity is when you start taking a look at the value of that carbon reduction. And so um, with, in re with respect to this microgrid system, we're also going to add layers of intellectual systems that basically collect this discrete data that hasn't in any way been touched by the electricity distribution system and try to figure out how we structure that data to have marketplace value. Um, and we think by doing that, we'll, provide, we'll be providing a real service to the industry because carbon credits and carbon offsets really can't be part of the uh, answer to uh, balancing out uh, slow-moving, non-sustainable uh, fossil fuels unless they have a provable, provable value. So we, we want to prove impact, we want to prove ownership, and we want to prove status. And um, that's really the, the end game in terms of what we're developing is to be able to create those, um, to create that understanding around uh, carbon intensity reduction and how it can be valued in a modern uh, marketplace. Awesome, thank you. All right, so you already kind of I started alluding. Yeah. I was gonna say, do you want yeah. me to elaborate on next cycle and what it was and uh, are you yes, getting there? Yes. Uh, sure. <laughs> sure. So, I'm here to provide some insights on, from the material management perspective, on you know, why the establishment of the next cycle and what it actually does. How many of you have a concept right now for you Michiganders or people from Ann Arbor? What is our recycling rate? Take a guess. Re resource recycling rate. Give me a random number. What do you think? 5%. We're doing slightly better than that. We're actually at 18% which is actually very bad compared to the benchmark of average national, national recycling rate. So the state of Michigan has a statewide goal of reaching 45% of material recycling rate. And to, get, to help us get there, we need to divert 2.7 million of recyclable materials away from the landfill. And that's gonna create a ton of economic output and labor income. So. Next Cycle was kind of launched out of that mission, and one of this format is through this accelerator. We um, attract and we identify and recruit sustainable solutions and innovational, innovational technological um, teams to our cohort and put them through six months of coaching, and by the end of it, we will help them get closer to the market. So that is basically Next Cycle, and um, I'm trying to say, anything else do we want to... Expand no, I on. definitely wanted to make sure RRS, what that was, and spelling it out. That's right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But so, yeah. No, I think actually while we're right here, you know, there was lots of mention between Missy and Pravina and then Heidi and Missy about partnerships and collaborations. Now, this transition, it's, it's going to take a tribe. So I'll ask the panelists, and you can start, Yohang, with, you know, what are some examples, case studies of really key Partnerships and collaborations, you know, how have they really helped develop and where else are they going? Yeah, for sure. So the design of Next Cycle is basically rooted upon partnerships and collaborations. Outside of the accelerator format I have mentioned, we actually are actively cultivating a, a dynamic partnership network that has over 133 partners throughout the ecosystem with the city, with, you know, manufacturers, brands, um, you know, in the energy fields, in all the waste and uh, recycling processing field as well. So all of the partners come together to be ready to foster and cultivate the newer solutions that's coming out to the market. But also our design, our cohort-based accelerated pro um, format is really encouraging all the teams we're recruiting to our platform to collaborate with each other. So one example I could give is West, um, the, the goodwill of West Michigan. When they were applying to our platform and our team was evaluating their applications, we were like, you could be a really good partner with this newer tech company called Hydroblocks. So the problem that Goodwill was facing is they were getting a lot of the non-recyclable plastics and they don't know what to do with it. And it's on their shoulder. It becomes their burden to process it. But this Hydroblox company could take those quote unquote waste plastics and turn them into storm 
water drainage management products. So we created this beautiful partnerships out of our cohorts, and right now they're out there in the world making a lot of great investments and pushing out products to solve real, real life issues, and that's, that's really a wonderful and powerful example. So when you talk about partnerships, you're talking about just in Michigan, or is it spread across the US that you're able to connect innovative, you know, startup ideas with big corporates? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great question. So the only criteria when we talk about next cycle is as long as your initiative can divert materials in, land, in the landfill in Michigan, we will help you find solutions and connect you with all different partners across the nation. So CLP, which is a very big closed loop partnership, they're a very big impact investing venture capital fund. They have pledged up to $5 million investment for any you know, qualifying Michigan project. So we have a lot of powerful you know, global, even national partnerships that we could have to offer. Uh, that was closed loop ventures, right? Yeah, closed loop. I heard loop. that right. Okay, so that's in New York, right? Yes, they're okay. based in New York and have operations in Arbor too. Awesome. All right. Anybody? Well, anyone? Else, you want to go high? Yeah. No, I think um, I think good partnerships generally start with the idea that at the end of the day, all partners are motivating one set of uh, cohorts to do something. So um, sustainability obviously is at the, at the finest level drills down to a set of choices that are gonna be made by consumers. And all of those little choices are gonna roll up into success. And so um, when we talk about uh, us partnering with the city of Ann Arbor, I mean, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be uh, sitting around a table uh, every day to figure it out, but it really is trying to understand what the objectives are, what the, what the mission and purpose is of each set of partners, and then carving out that space where you can agree on collaborating to, to really motivate change on the part of people. So when uh, Missy talks about creating uh, really uh, placemaking, or placemaking around, um, around sustainability, you know, a lot of that involves some of the other things that we do, like, you know, a coffee shop or a restaurant or the co-working space. Um, really understanding how we can sell that together as a modality and a choice that our, the people that live in Ann Arbor can make so that um, it becomes ingrained and those, those selections, those choices become natural. So we don't have to, we don't have to necessarily partner it's just that, you know, as a, as a business owner and as a citizen of Ann Arbor, it's kind of on me to understand how I can be successful within the framework that is going to make us ultimately reach this goal together. That's also very important to our business. Absolutely. A thousand percent. All right. Yeah, and I think for our company, uh, you know, as I said, we're doing commercial vehicles. So really the partnership is from a public-private par par partnership. So we've worked with states to understand what are the challenges, the, the voice of customer, who is going to be driving these vehicles, who are the fleet owners from a state perspective, from a government perspective, from a private fleet perspective, what are the challenges they say. So you're thinking about um, infrastructure for charging, you're thinking about logistics, right? So if you can optimize efficiencies in your logistics, it reduces your emissions because now you've found technology to do so. This is an industry that has as a little behind. It's, it's been the same delivery system, the same commercial trucks that you've been seeing for the last 50 years, the box, the box trucks that you see delivering packages. Um, and so we're, we're, we're challenging what that looks like from a design in terms of body, right? Finding light weighting, adding aerodynamics, but then you're also thinking about technology that will create efficiencies for the driver, for the fleet owner to reduce the number of stops. Maybe thinking about micromobility and how can we think about how maybe packages can be delivered in small deliveries in, a, in an urban environment and maybe in a rural environment is a different need. Do they need electrification? Do they need hybrid? Do they need hydrogen? Do they need an ice engine? So these are all things that we've talked about. Um, and last Wednesday, we, we made a big announcement where we announced our brand new delivery vehicle called the Proxima that we was developed by our company EAVX. And this will be uh, a vehicle that can be an ICE engine or an electric vehicle that can go from class two to five. That means it has a large range 
for capacity, and so that's called the Proxima. We also announced a partnership with the company Rivian uh, to do a use their skateboard chassis on a delivery vehicle that's a uh, called a 2B, which is a smaller vehicle, and it'll be first launched with Canada Post. So Canada Post has worked with us, and we are going to be doing Canada Post electric vehicles with a Rivian chassis, and we are the first company to move beyond Rivian's um, Amazon truck and the chassis that they've been using on their vehicles now and using it externally. And we hope that our partnership with Rivian can be used on all of our uh, delivery vehicles. And so Rivian was originally a Michigan company and we're a Michigan company. So this is a great little Michigan story. Um, but we're excited to see what the future is. I will say uh, continuing the conversations is part of that partnership because it is so we're in a time of a lot of change right now and changing a traditional industry to say, is it mandates that are pushing you or is it a want? And if even regardless, is the infrastructure gonna be ready for it and our city is gonna be ready for it? And I don't know if that we're there yet, but we're getting there. Congratulations, that's awesome. Woo! All right, Missy, will you do me the honor? Well, if you had other Are ideas you that you're gonna say, well, but no, it's that teamwork really quick. Time. Okay, wait, <laughs> wait. Uh, I'm gonna just answer the question you posed and then I'll go for that because I think that's a, a nice lead in. So from the municipal perspective, wherever you are, you live in a community, right? And that's, that's your sense of place. That's, that's your place that you can invest in. And for most of us, the greenhouse gas emissions in our community that we have any control over are often less than 2%. So if I want to be carbon neutral, I have to lean into collaboration, whether that's, if you know Ann Arbor, Zingerman's and work we're doing to turn them into a microgrid, the work with Heidi in Southtown, whether that's working with our electric bike companies to help make cargo boats more accessible for businesses, our work with the library system, the 2030 district, a local dairy. We, Y'all, we do beer. We brew beer and we make it shit beer to, to demonstrate what climate change will do to the hops so people understand because we love beer in Michigan. We have great beer in Michigan. And you know what? It's under threat from climate change. And so we do really fun, playful things to help bring people into the conversation. So teamwork is name of the game for the efforts that we're trying to do. And that's why I'm pretty excited to announce that in collaboration with Spark, and thanks so very much to the incredible folks there, today we are announcing that we are launching a green business challenge to help actually fund and support businesses throughout all of Ann Arbor with doubling down on their commitment to sustainability. There'll be a marketing budget, there'll be a funding budget. We'll provide from our office technical support. We are gonna demonstrate what it looks like to do this work holistically, to develop and to continue economic development in our community, to recruit more people in, and we are gonna expand that. We're gonna start in Ann Arbor, but we are gonna expand that throughout the entire region. So join us, learn more, coming very soon. Wait, why businesses? Woo! Why businesses? Why businesses? Why are you so focused on businesses? Because businesses matter. They're, I mean, this is the economic engine of our community, especially our small businesses. These are our entrepreneurs. These are the people that see our community and the opportunities and the challenges that we face, and we need to invest in them, and we need them to be champions of sustainability because when people walk in their door, whether you're getting a beer, you're getting ice cream, you're getting shampoo, I want you to know that our community cares about sustainability more than just as a nice to have, but it is the identifying feature of Ann Arbor. That was magical. <laughs> You're magical. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna get a little, lit, little I'm bit I'm just dirty. caught in the magical crossfire. Oh. <laughs> All right, we're gonna get dirty. We're gonna get a little bit dirtier in the form of, we talk about these great programs, we talk about initiatives, we talk about, you know, carbon credits. We talk a lot about, we want to do these things, but the PhD in me, I want to see the data. I want to know how much impact am I doing? How much are we actually contributing? You know, what's that black box looks like? Informed decisions. How are our efforts really making something do better? And so I wanted to hear some perspective on how you each are thinking about how is circular economy, how do you really quantify how much carbon how are you contributing to net zero over other efforts, for example? And each of you are from very different verticals, so you might look at that very differently and there might be different challenges. So I just wanted to take a moment to really just kind of dive into that. Um, I'll, I'll go first because I'm the, I may be a little odd <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> from what you all are doing. But really, I think it's building acceptance because as I mentioned, it's a traditional environment, right? Like this is a trucking industry, the work truck industry. So 
building acceptance of what does this mean and what is what is you know there's a lot of narratives out there so we can talk about this great world but what is the reality what is the cost of going into electrification for a work truck what is the cost of business what does that mean to their fleet what does that mean to um, their versatility to be ability to use that vehicle so I would ask that you know governments and private work together to help build a, a narrative that is in support build initiatives like you're saying to help fund small fleets that are going to be doing lawn care or that are going to be doing d d package delivery you know I'm not talking about the big companies I'm talking about the little ones that need that financial support to help move that forward help us build a better narrative or not a better uh, an, the correct narrative to understand the impact and what this means beyond sustainability because sometimes it is bottom line right it is we want to do good work and there's a cost to that, but what is the cost benefit? We need to bring that up. Beyond the, the mandates, we want people to want to do this because it's the, the right thing. So, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm marketing and communication, so I'm really working to try to help our industry understand the benefits uh, beyond the environment, but it's also beneficial to their drivers, to their fleets, to their bottom line in the long run. Think bigger picture. So maybe as a team, as a collective, we need to think about how we can bring all of our energy and our thoughts together to help push that needle because we can't be doing this separately. It is a holistic, like you said, Missy. I love that bottom line, just, just that. What's your bottom line? Yeah. All right, Yahang? Sure. So I know when we talk about carbon, it gets very big and vague and intangible really quickly, right? So you have buzzwords such as carbon offset, such as energy efficiency, utility, this and that. But I oftentimes feel like for me, it was just harder to comprehend and get a hold of because it's so out of touch of me. And the reason I was drawn to circular economy is it's about materials. It's about everything each one of you all wear and touch in our daily life. Every piece of these materials have a consequence and have an impact. The supply chain of how it was made all generates carbon throughout the process, right? So if, according to Project Drawdown, uh, this is a very famous research institute, if we max out efficiency of recycling in the States from now on to 2050, we are going to reduce about six gigatons of carbon emissions. That is equivalent to, imagine this, taking one billion cars off of US streets for the entire year. Can you believe that? Another stats for you. Right now, we only have 250 million cars registered in the US. So that is a huge impact that we can touch and influence every single day. So recycling not only, you know, help avoid the carbon emission that's generated through the virgin material extraction or mining process, but also help us turn the waste at the tail end instead of throwing them away in the landfill, but recirculating them into the feedback loop, turning the waste into a gold to feed stack of something new. So, you, you know, using recycled content in producing new products, that itself will reduce carbon emissions by 70%. So, you know, it's a, it's a huge deal, definitely. But I want to take a step back because a lot of folks were debating, oh, you talk about recycling all the time, but it's not a perfect system. I agree. There are 9,000 recycling programs in the States. It's chaotic, it's messy, and it's very confusing. That is not to say we shouldn't you know, demerit, we should demerit the effort of recycling, but eventually we will want to climb up that waste hierarchy. Before we get to the recycling stage, how can we reuse every single of these piece of products to extend its product life cycle? And when we design these products, how can we keep that in mind in the designers to have the, the consciousness of design this product to be reusable or recyclable? Or even before that, right? How do we optimize the demand into the supply of these materials that we're producing on a daily basis? So definitely a lot to, to touch on, but I'll, I'll leave it there. No, that was great. I love this education. It's fantastic. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, I'm gonna lean into metrics really quick and say, of course we measure greenhouse gas emissions, that's our mother metric, but for all of our actions, we also have other metrics. They are traditionally quantitative, but here's my plug. Not everything that matters can be measured. And so part of what we're trying to do is tell more stories. The impact it has on the low income household that suddenly isn't suffering from energy poverty because we've done energy efficiency work and we've helped them access renewables. That's gonna happen more and more. What? That's gonna happen more and more. It has to, right? I mean, we are, we are human, we are storytellers and we need to amplify the impact this has. So part of my job, I too have a doctorate, is thinking about the data and pushing us to different kinds of data to be able to build the movement because metrics work for some of us, but truth is most of us are already there that metrics are gonna work for. We Fair. need to be better storytellers. Fair. <laughs> well, in, in crafting my answer, I'm gonna rely on my doctorate in art history. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I do have a doctorate in art history, but it's got nothing to do with this. Um, so I, I, I think when we think about problems that we really want to solve and, and how we want to move the needle, um, I, I think the biggest problem that we have with sustainability relates to uh, the mindset that's wrapped around uh, traditional economic models. And in short, as my good friend Doug Song points out, people don't want to take risk. And so um, risk-taking around, uh, around anything new or anything different, especially when it uh, requires involvement of a lot of capitalized asset, um, requires a bellwether, um, some bellwether proof that there's going to be a payback on the investment. And, and I agree, Doug, you know, there won't, there, that's not for everybody. Some people will invest based on the idea that this is desperately needed. But I think really in order to move large scale investment in, in big picture infrastructure that's going to cost billions of dollars, we need, we need models of data that show us that the value is there. And people, you know, people that make decisions around this need to be shown the proof that there's a different way to approach it that can be economically viable and create the returns that, the kinds of returns that they're seeking. I think a big part of that unfortunately for them, is going to be um, the carbon offset markets going from voluntary to mandatory. Um, you know, and, and that will enhance the data of sustainability uh, in terms of, of these models that we put together that are um, looking at the opportunity in a different way. But um, we, need to, we need to move the needle with proof of concept that can be extrapolated to large-scale investment. Love that. Thank I don't you. want to bum you out, Missy, but we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> I really like Takes that. More than that moving Heidi. us from mandatory to voluntary. That is really the social change. I really like that. Yes. All right, wait, wait. We were, this was good. You were talking about funding and all the things, you know, how we got to be thinking about that. But let's, let's keep going with that. So we're going to, one of my favorite questions, and I always tell the startups, if you had a magic wand, what would, you, what would you do with your company? What would it look like? But instead, if your magic wand was funding, the funding that you needed, what would be your priorities? Now, you don't have to think about the next decade of what those priorities would do. I mean, there is, we don't even know that what tech will exist in the next 10 years, you know, post all this transition. So it could be for the transitional period, it could be something after, but what would you spend your dollars on? What priorities would those be? that really help continue to push our transition or really our net zero effort? I would have the government uh, work with investment banks and private equity to expand their business models to, because that's really where all of the uh, infrastructure investment needs to come from. It can't all be subsidized by the government. You know, retail banking is not the answer. Venture capital is not the answer. You know, we need large scale players to um, understand models that will really lead to large scale change. I mean, we're, we're running out of time for 2030 and um, you know, we can't, we've got to find another quadrant in the financial system that will really address the, the needs that we have. Anybody else? I think I'm going to lean into what Heidi said and I guess Doug's sage advice, which is I would probably use the capital to de-risk 
the kinds of investments so we have more and more entrepreneurship step in because I, did, I can't think of a single thing. I need so many different things, which means I need so many different people from different perspectives to step into the landscape. So let's make it easy for them to do that. So everything. Well, I would everything. create like a risk fund, like something that helps cover the delta or yeah. makes it easier for people to invest. Right. Green, green bonds. We yeah. talked about that. Yeah, Heidi yeah. and I talked about that earlier. It could be green bonds. Uh, it, I'm not a finance person, so this is hard for me. But if that's the thing that's holding people back, then invest in removing that barrier. Definitely. Oh, by the way, Doug, you see what we're doing here? You're like one more question. You're going to be an honorary badass woman from Michigan. <laughs> It's awesome. Only Lynn's allowed. Sorry, Doug. Yeah, I basically agree with these two, so I'll just pass it on to you. <laughs> I, I would say. I, I would think, though, there are a couple of streams of materials I personally feel very passionate about. One is about food. Everybody eats, but unfortunately, every day, we generate, you know, 44% of the food that was produced in the States was never consumed. It's directly being thrown out into the landfill. So with that, and we have a ton of work that we can act right now instead of 10 years later. So, and you know, the, the, the organic waste in the landfill are generating methanes, methanes, that's eight times of emissions than carbon dioxide. So that is definitely something every one of us can work on. Um, but yeah, so I think that's it's 21 times more potent. Uh, oh, 21? 21, 21 yeah. Times. So, I mean, that, that plays into exactly uh, what I'm talking about in terms of changing the business model. You know, when we talk about landfills, we're, the, we're really only talking about a real estate business. You know, the waste management is a real estate business. They're not, a, you know, it doesn't matter if they paint all their canisters green. They, they don't want to let go of the landfill. It's a, it's in a lucrative business between tipping fees, hauling fees, dumping fees. They, th that's probably the highest... A performing asset in, in all of real estate. It's incredible. So, you know, like we need to find ways to incent a change business model. But yeah, but it's pretty ingrained. And all of them are getting full now. So what do they do, right? We got to be creative of create, you know, creating some other solutions out there. See, I, I, I oh, cut like, down well, uh, DTE you're and potter, waste you're management. You're puttering something else. I'm trying to come up with a solution for this problem, but I'm going to need more time. <laughs> okay. Noted, noted. Maybe next year on our, our next, yeah, push together. Um, I also just wanted to put in here, because I, I represent a lot of startups, and I know one of the biggest challenges in really uh, just for startups is finding the people to do pilots with and the funding to be able to really help them accelerate and get into those pilots so that we can have data, learn, go faster. But I think it's really much a focus right now because you have to be able to accelerate some of these climate solutions. And so it is taking a lot of risk still, but finding the right partnerships and making sure that they are adequately supported so that we can make all of this work together, move forward. All right, so I was trying to look for time on things, but I think we have 10 minutes. Do we want to go? Yeah. We're going to go into questions. Questions. Well, I mean, we could. Yeah. We could start with Q&A, and then two, I still have some other questions too that we can roll through if not. Oh wait, speak up, or and maybe it's not on. I live here in Austin, and my neighbors don't use their green can. They don't know how to compost, or they don't know how to throw their compost away. And I tried to tell some of them, we get the newspaper every day, and you can kind of wrap it up in that. Or, um, but they're having a hard time. Thank you. Sure, I would love to. So you actually, thank you so much for that question because you touched on something that is crucial, which is education leading to aware and care, right? If we're not aware about the facts and the impact of our actions, nobody's going to care. And that's exactly what the general public nowadays is facing. Um, so I want to share an example from our team. We have a Innovate, innovative solution right now, a team that's using AI cameras that's being installed on recycling bins these days that can detect 
what kind of materials people are throwing into their recycling bin. If they're throwing a whole bunch of, you know, shitty stuff in there, this AI technology will be able to tell them real time and be following up with the residents and the households with educational materials. So I think a really big piece that we need to put into the puzzle there is effective, customized education, just like what you are trying to do, but we need it on a much larger scale and systematic and innovative solutions to teach people and make it aware. Impact of composting is, tra is dramatic and we need more people to be, you know, learning about it and hearing about it for sure, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Was there any other questions? So actually about, yeah, all right. On education, so, you know, Austin's a college town, Ann Arbor's a college town, and there are a lot of others uh, in around the country. And so how can we partner with education? Because there are a lot of people that want to know what to do locally, like our neighbors, we want to get them to do the right thing. But how can we get students to, and how can we get colleges to integrate into their curriculum, not just the kids who want to study it, but everybody? How can we make that happen? Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm going to take this educational question and go bigger than just academia and higher ed for a second. So what we're doing with the University of Michigan, which would be our major institution, although we also work with Washtenaw Community College, uh, we're working with them on workforce development efforts and bringing more people into the field and trying to make the city an open employer to say there are jobs on the other end, so come in, right? Like, come in, we need you. In terms of the University of Michigan, we collaborate on things like just recently we worked with the School of Architecture and the School of, uh, or and an energy school, the engineering, to design a geothermal model, which honestly is literally just a thing that shows you what geothermal looks like. So we could use it for community engagement because who knows what it looks like? It's underground, you can't see it. And so the landscape architect students got to design above ground, the engineering students designed the underground system, and they got real world experience and feedback on why their designs did or did not make sense to the public, helping them be more effective when they go to the marketplace. But we also work with our Ann Arbor Public Schools because it's a little too late when someone's in college, they've sort of already picked their path. So we work with high school students. We have an environmental education center. They actually just spoke yesterday at a conference. They were the, the keynotes and they introduced all the speakers talking about why this work matters. And we're working with them to make sure they're skilled in terms of public speaking. They can go out and talk to others. And then we're looking to sponsor a science fair with younger folks to help them get really excited about climate and then to put their artwork and their displays out in the public so their parents can be proud and we can all celebrate them. So really kind of leaning in to why this matters. Uh, and then the last thing I'll add is with Ann Arbor, the city and our public schools, we actually launched a grant program where we give students uh, all the way from kindergarten up to 12th grade $500 to do a sustainability project in their school, which may not seem like a lot, but in a school you can do a lot with that kind of money. Yeah. I think what's really key to, to re-emphasize is Focusing on sustainability in this industry, it needs an entire workforce. There, it is a economic driver for for jobs, for uh, innovation. I mean, it comes with everything. So it's really a unique opportunity to rebuild and rebuild strong with all these ideas and focuses built on sustainability for the future. All right, we have another question. One minute left. Okay. Should we wrap it up? Yeah, okay, I appreciate. Well, thank you, ladies. I really appreciate you being with us here today and um, let's give them a round of applause for you guys. And thanks to everybody coming out to see our panel that is focused on sustainability and, and really just, I wanna say green power just in general, but yes. Appreciate it, and thanks to Ann Arbor Spark for joining us and sponsoring. I think we have a happy hour at some point today. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe at four. I think you'll be out there. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Thank you all. <laughs>